I don't know your experience with church or faith or Christianity, but listen, I am like anyone else. I'm like, I'm like any of you, okay? I often need to fix my focus back on Jesus because I get lost in the small things. I get lost in the details. I get distracted so easily by some pretty small things, and I just get bogged down in the details. Are you like that? You ever like that, right? Um, Like, it's just the small things, the weird situations that just distract you. We're going to take some time today to talk about our greater purpose. If you call yourself a follower of Christ, we just want to take some time to remind ourselves of this great purpose that Jesus uh, gives us. But I just want you to know, listen, like anyone else, my soul needs a reminder just as much as yours does. And so I don't know if you are here today, and maybe this morning was rough, I don't know if you're here today and this week was good or bad, this month, the last couple of years, I think I know. I don't know where you're at, but I think our souls simply need a reminder of what is good, of what is true, of of what is holy. Do you need to fix your focus back on God today? Are you with me? Are you with me, church? I also want to remind you that you have a calling and a purpose from God. And so we've spent the last few weeks in a series called This Is Us because we just want to remember who are we? Who is it that God created us to be? And so today, I'm I'm calling today Released. This Is Us, we are released. If you are the note taker and and that is is where you're at, write that down. We are released. We're going to jump around in the New Testament a bit today, but if you want to flip over to Matthew chapter 5, we're going to start there. And Jesus, in Matthew 5, picking up in verse 14, Jesus is reminding us of our greater purpose, of our calling. If you're here today and you think, well, I'm just a Christian and I just do this, or I just do that, I don't do anything else. No, you have a calling. There is a purpose for you. There is a purpose for you to exist Okay, and Jesus is going to remind us of that, and uh, I'll remind you of why we have a big goofy chair up here in just a minute. It's all about the mystery. Got to keep you all, got to get your attention up here, okay? Matthew 5, verse 14. The, The opening sentence is huge. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Church, that is, that is huge, You are not only a teacher struggling with NTI. You are the light of the world. You are not just an insurance salesman on Zoom call after Zoom call. You are not just a government employee. You are the light of the world. That sentence is huge. He is saying you bring light where there is darkness. If you claim to follow Jesus, you are a bringer of light. And so again, this is big picture purpose, and someone today just needs to be reminded that God moves in the super normal. Because I think, like many of us, myself included, we wait to see the supernatural and say, look at God. When, as as I read the Bible, and as I understand the mission of Jesus, it wasn't about waiting around for the supernatural, but it was about expecting God to show up in the super normal in the super monotonous, in the super boring of your life. That you are the light of the world in the super average. That that God is there. The issue is, are you paying attention? Are Are you aware that God is wanting to move in your super normal, super monotonous, super average moments? That God is there. And so I want to I want to help us see that uh, because Jesus he continues in Matthew 5:14 he says a city set on a hill cannot be hidden nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand and it gives light to all in the house in the same way let your light shine before others so that it, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your father who is in heaven you know, sometimes, uh, you know, well-meaning people, you know, every time you start a sentence like that, you're like, where is this going? You know, it's, it's often well-meaning, well-intentioned people who I think uh, approach things well, 
they, they will approach me and say, hey, like, Pastor, like, this was a good service. Uh, could we go a little deeper, though? Could we go a little deeper in theology on Sunday? So listen, listen, I hear you, and I want to help you, all right? I want to meet you where you're at. So this, this here is a what? What is it? Chair. Gosh, here we go. We're going places today, all right? And it is made for what? It's made for what? Sitting. Yes, yes. And it's made for sitting with your what? You can say it. It's made for sitting with your, with your butt, right? Oh, man. Y'all, this sermon is already changing lives. I can feel it. It's a theological thought, right? We, we, we sit in the chair, and we, we sit in it with our, our butt, right? So allow me to reframe what Jesus is telling us, and I promise I'll make this make sense, okay? So Jesus says, you are the light of the world. You have a job to do. But I feel like a lot of us today, we love, we love Jesus like this. God, look at you go. Look at you use that person. Man, that was great in worship today. Look at you go. And we sit on these butts, B-U-T, all the time. God, you know, I would help that person on the side of the road, but I'm busy. But I'm on my way to church, ironically. <laughs> but I'm on my way to small group. Jesus says, be the light of the world. That doesn't mean that we get to sit and watch everyone else. I, I think so many of us, maybe we're in the middle of something so important and it feels so important, but we miss the point. The purpose of the gospel is to give it away, not to just get pats on the back from other Christians, but to give that love away to people who don't know Christ. We need to be reminded of our purpose, and that is what Jesus is doing right here. He's saying, you are the light of the world, but we come with plenty of excuses, right? Right? And we like to sit down and, and, and watch things, but I just want to encourage you today. I want to encourage someone today. That this life is meant to be lived on purpose and not just to be watched from the sidelines. I mean, does anyone recognize the old phrase? Maybe you've heard it, uh, the Great Commission. Does that sound familiar? Okay, well, um, if I were to bring a microphone to you, how confident are you in your ability to recite to me the Great Commission? You know, I think we're pretty astute people around here. I, I, I'm confident in your all's abilities. I won't. But a couple of years ago, uh, the Barna Group did a study, and they found out, I'll go ahead and throw the chart up on the screen, 51% of churchgoers claim to have never heard it. They claim to have never heard it. So unfamiliar, they said, I've never heard that. I don't know what that is. Rock Vineyard, we are not going to have that excuse, okay? So here it is, Great Commission, Matthew 28, picking up at verse 16. It says, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore. Here it is. Great commission. Highlight it. Chapter nine, uh, verse 19 right here. Go therefore and make disciples of America. No, what does it say? What does it say? Come on all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you to the end of the age. Listen, it is simple. Listen, Christians, it's simple. Be light in a world full of darkness. Share your faith with others. Go make a difference. It is so simple, and yet often we will we will compartmentalize this into thinking, well, that's just for the pastor. Let's see, let's, let's read that again. Pastors, go therefore and make, it doesn't say that, right? This is for us, this is for you, this is for me. It's for all of us. Because listen, you need to know that this stage is not more important than those seats. Jesus, he came to turn everything upside down. He uses you, he uses me, he uses all of us. And so we do like an encouraging sermon that makes us feel good on a Sunday. But by Monday, we go back to our same old perspective, same old complaints, our same old headaches, 
and our same old sucky attitude that the life-changing message of God's love is no longer rooted into our hearts, but it's been packed away like an old suitcase. Something simply has to change. Are you with me, church? Something has to change inside of us because we can be excited after a message, but if we aren't seeing lives transformed through the week, then I would say we are failing as a church, that this thing is not in us. It, It may be something that we say, It may be something that we say we believe, but is it in us? Because if it's in us, it's going to come out of us, right? I don't know who said this. I'm about to make a lot of us mad. Uh, Listen, I don't know who said it, so I don't know who you could be mad at. I even Googled it. Nothing showed up. But I've heard it put this way, uh, just quite bluntly. Uh, If you aren't sharing the gospel, it's because you probably don't believe the gospel. And that makes me angry. And the more I wrestle with it, the more I think there's a lot of truth to it. What what is the gospel? What is the good news? Christ died, Christ rose, Christ loves you, and he wants to reach more people, right? If you aren't sharing the gospel, you probably don't believe it. You can't go and make disciples if you're obsessed with keeping a nice, Christian, comfortable bubble. How can, you, how can you grow in faith? How can you reach more people if you just surround yourself with people who think and act and believe everything like you do? It's difficult, right? And, and I'm preaching to myself right now, I promise. It is so difficult. But your calling from God is not supposed to make you comfortable. Your calling from God is to release love to any and everyone. Are you with me, church? Are you awake this morning? Can you tell I'm excited? It's not just a Super Bowl. I'm just excited to share this with you, I promise. So I want to share this, this quick story from Luke 19, and, and it, is, it is a classic story. Many of you know it. If you grew up in Sunday school, then you heard this story all the time. But I want to go through this story, and I want to pull three excuses out of it. And I want to pull three, we'll say, here's the statement, but God, right? I want to pull three of those excuses, three of those buts out of this story from Luke 19, this is, this is in the ministry of Jesus. This is what's happening. Go ahead and put up on the screen for us. It says, Jesus entered, he entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead, climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. For he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to that place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. Oh, don't they always? Don't they always when something something good's going on? You always got people that grumble, right? They all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Underline that last verse. My goodness, that is so key. Verse 10. The Son of Man, that is, that's Jesus calling himself, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Pastors, on average, will give you three points and a pat on the back. I'm going to give you three butts today and a kick in the rear, church, okay? Because we got work to do. And if we're being honest, this world needs it. This world needs it. You know this. The world needs This love of God, right? And if I'm being really honest, I'm just, I'm tired of doing funerals for people with drug problems. It's preventable. Why aren't we being light in the darkness? I'm tired of of seeing chronic poverty and generational poverty. Imagine what would happen if light met that darkness. I'm, I'm just tired that our black brothers and sisters don't feel safe everywhere they go. A little bit of light can go a long way. Are you with me, church? I'm just tired of acting like, well, the darkness is big, it's bad, it's so scary, so I'm just going to get over here because it's just too much. 
Can you imagine if Jesus did this? How stupid do I look? Okay, like, imagine if Jesus did that, you know? Well, there's a guy up in a tree, but I got stuff to do, you know? Like, no, no. I don't want to sit on these excuses. I don't want to give God a but, whatever. I I don't want to do that. I'm just tired of the way we, myself included, that we make excuses and we sit back and we watch the world go by and we complain about it. And we say, God, why don't you do something? I'm sure he wants to ask you the same question. Why are we so hesitant to give away the greatest news of all? And I promise I'm not preaching against you all. I'm preaching with all of us because I struggle with this too. Okay? So as, as I sit down, of course, I'm not talking about your literal but. I'm talking about the excuses that we give God. You know, when we say, you know, God, I would stop and help, but I have plans. You know, I would actually give to this cause, but you know, money is tight. I'll share the link. Same thing. Or, you know, God, I, I wish things would change around abortion, but I don't have time to volunteer at a pregnancy help center. I'll tell everyone else what they should do. I'll tell everyone else they, ne- they need to adopt. I'll even post it on Facebook and get 20 likes. I'll feel really good about myself, and yet I did nothing. Right? Like, like isn't this like just uh, convenient Christianity? Like, faith is real. Imagine if Jesus just walked by Zacchaeus and said, hey, son of God, you want to be forgiven? And just like never broke stride. I, I feel like drive through faith is kind of something I see everywhere but it's not something I ever see in the Bible. And so I just want to encourage us that we, to, that we must stop with the excuses because we are released onto this world, not to beat people over the head with the Bible, not to make people feel guilty for not coming to church. No, we are commissioned to give this love away. That's what we are to do. I don't, I don't want you to leave church today either talking about a great moment in worship. I don't want you leaving church today thinking, well, that was a great moment in the sermon or a great moment, whatever. Because if you're a Christian, we need to stop worshiping these little moments because Jesus started a movement. And it's like we're waiting for God to move in the moment and God is just waiting for us to move in the moment ourselves. Jesus changed the world with a movement. So why are we chasing moments? Well, you know, I didn't really feel God today. I don't know, I didn't really have a, have a spiritual moment today. Is, is that how we view God? Is that how we've cheapened the good news of Christ to feeling a moment? No. I just want to encourage you today that you don't have to look for the supernatural to then move. Simply look for the supernormal and ask God to use you in that. And so here is the first excuse I think we use. I use it. I think we use it. But God, I'm so busy. I am so busy. You know, there are needs left and right, but I'm busy. It was a long day today. I'm busy. I think think Christians will often confuse a busy life for a holy life. Right? Oh, I'm so busy. Look at all the stuff I'm doing. Look at this and look at that. That doesn't mean that we're actually doing anything with our faith, but it feels nice. Let's not confuse the two. Are are, are we really participating in this good news? Are we giving this thing away? Do you have time to be interrupted? I mean, what do you think Jesus was doing? At this point, look, go back to the Bible. It says at this point, Jesus was passing through Jericho. It It was a nowhere place. He had somewhere else to go. He was passing through Jericho. He had things to do, people to see, but he sees a peculiar looking guy up in a tree and he says, you know what? This is worth stopping everything for. This is what I'm doing. Jesus made time to be interrupted because he knew his mission. It was people. It was one another. And so church, I just want to tell you, we are equally surrounded by divine opportunities to love people and distracting opportunities to ignore people. Are you the kind of person that sees the guy up in the tree and says, I need to go talk to him? Or are you the kind of person like me sometimes? There's a guy in a tree. I ain't, I, I ain't touching that. <laughs> I'm, I'm steering clear of whatever that is. Right? In a given day, what steals your attention? What steals your joy? 
What distracts you from being used by God day in and day out? I am unsure. I'm unconvinced we're as busy as we say we are. I think we're more distracted than anything else. You know, there's stress at work. There is stress at home. What is holding you back? What's holding me back from making a difference exactly where you're at in the super normal? Because when I read the Bible, I see countless people who are minding their own business, doing what they were always used to doing, but in a moment, God interrupts and moves radically in their life. I mean, uh, I used to, like, I don't know why I did this. And, and so if you do this, I just want to encourage you, maybe drop that habit. That's, that's, that's really not a good thing. Uh, it's hard to let go of. Um, but I used to get social media notifications directly on my phone. Like you need your phone to ding about something else, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, so Facebook messages, Instagram likes, like whatever. It would ding, 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 ding. You know, a little serotonin, feel good at 2 or 3 p.m. Oh, I needed that, you know. Anyway, a couple of years ago, someone messaged me. And uh, my wife and I, it's when we were uh, up in Michigan, we were doing a Christmas Eve rehearsal, and it was going so great. And, and just like the devil does, right, here's a little distraction for you. And I get a little message, and I can tell, you can read the first couple of lines of the message. And I see it, and I see who it's from, and I think, ooh, spicy. So I open it, because that's what you should do, right? I'm enjoying the people I'm around. Let me check out. And it was, it was this person who was very, very upset. And they misunderstood a situation that happened years earlier. And they were just now letting me know what they thought of me and my family, and how disappointed they were in me, and like all these things. And... This was literally just the Spirit of God. It didn't offend me all that much. I just was kind of like, oh, whatever. Hey, Kels, can I ruin your evening? Look at this, you know, and I handed it to her. And she was ready to fight. She saw it, and she's like, give me that phone number. Like, you don't mess with the lioness. I have figured out. You don't mess with Mama Bear. You're going to get the teeth. Uh, and I just was like, it's not a big deal, you know. And, you know, she wanted to, like, defend me and say, like, no, it is. And then she, she said, why aren't you more upset about this? Uh, and I don't know if it was the holiest thing I could have said, but it's what I said, and I'm just going to tell you. I said, Kels, I don't care for the opinions of small-minded people, and neither should you. I'm not saying I don't love that person, but why, why would I care about this little stone that got, that got thrown? Right? We, we used to have this on our chalkboard written in our home, and I needed this reminder today for sure. Um, but we used to have written on our chalkboard, uh, this family is too busy slaying giants to care what people think of us. Could you make that maybe like your banner for the year or, or at least for the month? Come on, it's a short month. Like imagine if we devoted ourselves to that idea, right? You think you got haters? Really? Or is it just someone who's a little mad at you? Just a distraction. Who cares? I mean, do you really have problems? There are big problems. I don't want to touch those right now. But, you know, the small stuff that, 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 that just cause all sorts of discomfort and distraction, are they really problems or are they just distractions? Because if we fail to recognize the difference between a distraction worth dismissing and a giant worth slaying, the enemy will keep you so busy, you will fail to see opportunities for God to use you in the supernormal because you're consumed by something else that doesn't even matter. We are released onto this planet to give this love of Christ away. But we just get caught up. Well, I don't, I don't like the way she looked at me. I don't like the way he drives. I don't like her Facebook posts. He doesn't follow me back on Instagram. Whatever. Didn't like him anyway. Right? We just... You laugh because you know it's true, okay? But this is what we do. And we just give these excuses, so we sit down, and we just say, I'm out. That's not how this works. That's not how faith works. We're always in, Okay? But here comes the next, the next excuse that we give. This is what I think we say to God sometimes. Instead of giving this good news away, instead of sharing the love of Christ with others, we say, but God, I am not qualified for this. I am not a pastor. I am not a theologian. I don't have the Bible memorized. I don't know what the word Trinity even means. Last time I went to Bible school was vacation Bible school. 
You know, that was, that was just summer semesters. Look back at verse 5, though, okay? This is a key right here. Verse 5, look. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, hurry up and come down. I'm coming to your house. Church, when Jesus encountered Zacchaeus, he didn't qualify what he said with his degree or boast about his credentials. He saw someone far from God, and he said, I'm going to meet with you. It is that simple. Because God doesn't call the qualified. God qualifies the called. And if you call yourself a Christian, that means he's qualified you. You are qualified immediately. Oh, but God, I am just a broke college student. God, I am a stay-at-home parent. Imagine, imagine for a moment if Jesus said, but God, I'm just a, a carpenter. I'm from Nazareth. Ain't no, nothing good comes from Nazareth. Listen, Jesus had one title, and it was carpenter, but he was always Messiah. Your title may be barista, but you are always a Christian. Your title may be mechanic, but you are always a Christian. You are a walking revival. And Jesus says, go. Our response shouldn't be but. Our response should be where, who, what. What are, what are my next steps? I just think that we are walking around grocery stores, we are walking around parking lots, we're walking through a school of people who are far from God, and you could absolutely change the trajectory of their day, of their life, of their eternity, with just a little awareness, with getting out of our own lives, without, with, with just getting out of our own distractions, and just paying attention, just looking around for a moment. Jesus said, go be light, so why not? Why shouldn't that be us? You don't have to wait for the spiritual moment. You don't have to wait for the moment where like, God, you're moving in this person's heart. I'm just going to sweep in in this last 1% and help them over the finish line. I I'm telling you, it does not have to be a super spiritual moment at all. Uh, when we lived in Michigan, I played, I still do a little bit, I played a ton of Pokemon Go up there. It was, it was such a, a cool thing up there. They had their own community, hundreds of people out playing Pokemon Go with us. And so, you know, your boy had to go out there with him. And slowly and surely, I get to know all these awesome weirdos. Because, you know, like the people who play that game aren't really, you know, in church all that much. And so I just got to know him. And, you know, at some point, not to make it like too weird, but I just found a little on-ramp to invite him to church. Hey, we got this church. I think you belong. I think this could be a great place for you. Listen, church, I got turned down plenty of times. I got laughed at a couple of times. And it was fine. It was all worth it when the one guy said, really? Really? I've been looking for a church. I feel far from God. It was all worth it. We just stopped what we were doing. And we just like stopped. And in that moment, I just prayed with him just to encourage him. Not to say, now come to church. or, or they, just There was an invitation. I want to pray with you, man. There was no stage. There was no band. No light show. Super normal. We get caught up in looking for the supernatural. We forget God moves in that super normal. Just requires a little bit of boldness, just a little bit of faith, just a little bit of confidence. Church, when you do that, also don't get discouraged when it doesn't happen instantly. Because God is working constantly. I mean, if you look back at at people who did great things, you know, former presidents, revolutionaries, whatever. It's not that one day they did something incredible. It's that every day in the super normal, they showed up. They, they, they believed something more would happen. What if tomorrow, on Super Bowl hangover Monday, okay? What if tomorrow you woke up and you said, I'm going to embrace the Holy Spirit. I'm going to be relentlessly kind today. God, give me the resilience like a coach lasso, just the kindness that helps me just reach people today. Let me respond with kindness today. What if you did that tomorrow? What would happen? What would people think? Would they think there's something wrong with you? What if tomorrow you woke up and you said, I'm going to reach out to one person today, one person. That's it. What if you woke up and said, I just I want to help someone today. Imagine what would happen if the people of God showed up in the super normal and we expected God to make it supernatural. But God, 
God, I'm, I'm not qualified for this. Yes, you are. If you are willing to show up in the super normal, God will meet you in the supernatural. Sometimes it takes time. Press in. Jesus saw a man up in a tree and it changed the man's life and eternity. And it was just a super normal moment that became a supernatural movement. My job, your job, is to be used right here, right now, so that people will see the beauty of God through our broken lives. Listen, going back just a few weeks, remember I said this isn't about having a, a pure-looking faith and it's all great all the time and you never sweat. It's about messiness and embracing that mess. We, have, we are broken people just trying to point others to Christ. Let's get rid of our last excuse. You ready? Maybe life's going well, and we have this moment where we think, oh, I could share my faith right here, right now. Oh, but, God, I'm nervous. I'm nervous. What if it's weird? What if I sound stupid? What if I say something dumb? Like, like, what if I say something that isn't exact theology? What if, what if this? What if that? You know, oh, I'm just, I'm so nervous. Listen, I think Jesus certainly had an opportunity to be nervous when he's talking to Zacchaeus, right? Uh, I, I, I need to look at my notes. Sorry, I don't know it all that well. In here somewhere, right? Verse 7, I knew it, I knew it. Verse 7, verse 7, it says, And when they saw it, they all grumbled, he's gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Oh, how often do we give ourselves over to those little things? They're going to think I'm weird. They're going to think this, they, that, they, whatever. That, that's what we think, right? They're going to think whatever. Imagine if Jesus did that for a sec. He, it's, it's biblical. It was right there. He could have. Okay? Uh, Pre-COVID, I've been working on my, my dad bod right now, but pre-COVID, I used to go to the gym a lot. But... It took me some time to get comfortable around the free weights because I've, I've always been a slim guy, so treadmill it is. Or, you know, the machines with the exact instructions. Yeah, that was, that was me. Yeah, because I don't know what I'm doing otherwise. But I would always avoid it, and my excuse was always, I don't want to look stupid. But Jesus is not like me. Jesus is different. Jesus, he hears the grumbling, and he's not nervous. He's, 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 he just, he hears the grumbling. He knows what's happening. But I think, I think he had a decision to make. And the question is, am I going to disappoint people or am I going to disappoint God? I think if we simply ask ourselves that question, I think our lives would look a lot different too. I know, I know mine would. Am I going to disappoint people or am I going to disappoint God in this? God, he has commissioned us, if you call yourself a follower of Christ, to go and tell the world, to make disciples, to share our faith, to invite someone to church, to tell someone about the love in your heart, because the church it doesn't exist for, for just us. But Christians, we are the church, and we exist for others. Church is not a place you go. Church is an identity that you embrace. But don't be nervous. Or if you are, it's fine. I get nervous. I still get nervous, believe it or not. I get more nervous when I'm about to invite someone to church, a cashier. I get a little more nervous sharing my faith with someone at Kroger than I do stepping up on this stage. It's fine. It's fine. Just move with it. Philippians 4, 6 says, Be anxious for nothing but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And as I read that verse, there is a world of difference, by the way between depression and anxiety and situational anxiety. Uh, and so here, when I read Philippians 4, 6, I think a great synonym could be, be nervous for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. Sharing your faith, that's nothing. Listen, listen, right here, right here. You can be burdened and not be nervous. You could be broke and not be nervous. You could be concerned and not be nervous. You could find drugs in your kid's room and want to beat them half to death, but not be nervous. 
Jesus says, share this testimony. Share your faith. The Bible says, do not be anxious. Do not be nervous. Step out in that faith because you and I are the hands and feet of a Jesus who loves us exactly as we are and yet way too much to let us stay where we are. We can't afford to hold on to this another day. We, we can't wait until, well, one day when I'm married, one day when I have kids, one day when I can go to church every Sunday, one day when fill in the blank, whatever. We can't just sit around and bring up excuse after excuse after excuse. Because the world is, it is lost and it's dying. And it can be scary. It can make you nervous. But take heart. Because Jesus has overcome the world. He can handle a little bit of nervousness for you at Kroger. He can handle a little bit of nervousness for you at a Super Bowl party. He can handle a little bit of nervousness for you at a family gathering. He can handle that. Let's not make God so small that he can't handle these things in our hearts. And so, uh, church, I just, I, if you hear nothing else, could we just take some time to reflect on God? Where am I making excuses? I'm unconvinced you're called to go out on the corner of Bardstown Road with a bullhorn and, and, and yell at people. I'm not saying you, you, you're not, yeah, whatever. I'm unconvinced of it. But what if we didn't look at it like that? What if instead we said, all right, God, I don't want to just look for the supernatural. I want you to move in the supernormal. I just, I want to be aware. I just want to pay attention. And I just want to see how you're at work in my life and in the lives of others. Oh, there's a man up in a tree. What's our response to that? There's someone laying down on the sidewalk right out here. What's our response to that? There's, there's a parent at the store and their kids are kind of all over the place. What if instead of saying, oh, you got your hands full and keep going, like what if we actually stopped and interacted a little bit for a sec? Just share a little bit of grace. Share a little bit of mercy, a little bit of love with others. You'd be surprised what happens in the supernormal when we actually embrace it and we think this, this could turn supernatural. Let's show up in the supernormal and see God move.